Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 110, The End of the USSR. Now, before we begin, I have to apologize for, again, having this podcast late, but the flu bug hit the Shouse family, and in particular, my voice. So while I had everything ready for last Sunday, it just wasn't to be because my voice just wasn't there, and I didn't want to go out and record a podcast with a scratchy, coughing, and sniveling uh, voice. So apologies uh, to all. Uh, but we're ready to go on with our last episode of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, one other note, uh, I am leaving for a long trip to Australia. I'll be teaching uh, classes in uh, laboratory medicine, which is my uh, career and my job. So I will be off to uh, Sydney and Melbourne. And if any of my listeners out there are from those cities, I'd love to get together with you. Uh, maybe we can have lunch or a cup of coffee or something like that and talk Russia. All right, let's get going. Last time, we recounted the disastrous state of the Soviet Union and how Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev tried to reform the system, but unfortunately he did so without thinking things through. Now, on our Facebook page, Russian Rulers History, there's been some discussion on how I've been treating Gorbachev a little bit too harshly. Now, to be honest, I can agree with that. But with much justification based on the research I've done. But what you have to admit is that his effect on the West and their opinion of him is pretty stellar. He did put an end to the disastrous Cold War and the arms buildup that had no benefit to mankind at all. There were many other accomplishments that he achieved. Some of them we will discuss in today's podcast. Now the year is 1989. And there's growing resistance to Gorbachev's reforms, especially from the conservatives in the Central Committee, the Politburo, the military, and the KGB. He knew that he needed to shake things up, lest he lose power. Last episode, we mentioned the retirement of Gromyko and the shuffling of the ministers within his government. Gorbachev now fully embraced the concept of democratizza, or democratization. This meant that for the first time since the days of the Novgorod Vech, people would have a chance to elect their leaders. To do this, Gorbachev had a new legislative body created, the Congress of the People's Deputies. Understand that while he did not open the floodgates to multi-party elections, as this did not happen until 1993, he did open things up a great deal. Contested elections occurred throughout the Soviet Union, which frightened the nomenklatura and the entirety of the bureaucracy. But this is where the paradoxes of Gorbachev's position bear looking into. Even though he created a new system where the entrenched bureaucrats no longer had a guaranteed position, it was only accomplished because of the centralized system with Gorbachev being a top. No one dared counter the authority from above. As had been said, this, quote, facilitated reforms that went beyond the wildest dreams of Soviet dissidents and surpassed the worst nightmares of the KGB. By now, Gorbachev decided that some of his reforms needed to be reeled in a bit, especially the disastrous anti-alcohol campaign. Not only did they limit the taxes coming in, they strictly controlled the quantity of alcohol produced. It helped fuel the huge budget deficit, but had benefits as it did reduce alcohol-related accidents and resulted in better health for the overall population. Still, the people were really not being deprived of their vodka as moonshiners cropped up everywhere. Same problem has occurred with the United States during their prohibition period. A criminal underground was being created unwittingly that would flourish after the end of the Soviet Union and continues until today. This is where I believe the Russian Mafia had its true, real beginnings. Throughout Soviet history, they created numerous five-year plans, many of them being unrealistic ideals, especially during Stalin's rule. Gorbachev was to top them all with the incredibly unrealistic 500-day plan that would try to recreate the Soviet economy from a socialist one to one that would be a market-based economy. 
This was met with swift and strong opposition from the Communist Party. But now, in the summer of 1990, Gorbachev was no longer deriving the majority of his power from his position as the head of the party, but as the elected president of the Soviet Union by the Congress of the People's Deputies of the USSR, which occurred in March of 1990. Now, here's a moment when Gorbachev's hesitation worked in his disservice. He believed in the radical marketization program, but began to make concessions to the conservatives. This is when Boris Yeltsin begins to make his presence known to a greater extent. Yeltsin was a strong proponent of even more radical reform and began to make his concerns about the concessions more vociferously and more public. Gorbachev was becoming irritated with his now former ally. While all this was going on, the Warsaw Pact was beginning to fall apart, and there was a new issue coming up, the reunification of Germany. One of the most important reasons for the collapse, according to Vladislav Zubok in his book, A Failed Empire, was Gorbachev's absolute, quote, aversion to the use of force. His colleagues confirmed this position when they said, quote, the avoidance of bloodshed was a constant concern of Gorbachev, and, quote, for Gorbachev, an unwillingness to shed blood was not only a criterion but the condition of his involvement in politics. Many within his administration and a large number of his critics believe that this unwillingness to use force when necessary was a fatal flaw and led to lawlessness that was found after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Now, mind you, there were uses of force and some large losses of life during the protests within the USSR, like the one in Tbilisi in April of 1890. 18, I mean, excuse me, 18, 1989, and the incident in Baku in 1990, and Vilnius and Riga in January of 1991. But these were isolated incidents, and none that we know of were ordered by Gorbachev. While it is now apparent that the Soviet Union was in a state of chaos, but while the West lauded Gorbachev's hesitancy to use force, within his own country the people were appalled. They felt that this personality trait was considered to be one of the main reasons for the collapse of the entirety of the Soviet sphere of influence and the dissolution of the USSR itself. When it comes to foreign affairs, Gorbachev no longer consulted with members of the Central Committee or the Politburo. He now only consulted his foreign minister, Edward Shevardnadze. Beginning in 1989, the Eastern Bloc countries began to revolt against communist rule. One by one, Poland, Hungary, the GDR, Bulgaria, and Romania fell. The policy of Gorbachev and Shevardnadze was not to interfere, and they would not. What they did not realize at that is that this would eventually cause the collapse of their own country. The Soviet leadership, now known as the New Thinkers, were all in on the non-interventionist policies. These men included Yakolev, Shevardnadze, Chernyak, and Shaknazarov. They firmly believed that if they intervened, that what would happen would be, quote, a most acute social-political conflict with an unfathomable outcome. In January of 1989, with his power over the military assured, Gorbachev began to reduce the military, especially in the East. This was done to help reduce the budget, but by now it was woefully too late. In the past, the Soviet government would have used their financial resources to stem the tide in Europe, but they had nothing. The West stepped into that vacuum more than willingly, seeing a huge opportunity. Step by step, the Warsaw Pact was falling apart. Hungary started by removing all barriers to movement within their borders. People from East Germany began to flood over the borders. Gorbachev was by now ready to remove all troops from Germany, but as Chernyayev remembers, government officials were really aghast. They said, quote, What did we fight for? 
What did millions of our soldiers die for in World War II? Are we renouncing all that? Back in the U.S., the Bush administration was kind of hesitant to embrace Gorbachev's new policies. West German Chancellor Kohl was not. Talks began to take place about the reunification of the two Germanys. But what has historians puzzled is that Gorbachev made no attempt to demand that a reunified Germany become neutral and not join NATO. As for East Germany's leader, Erich Honecker, he was no longer a favorite of the Soviets, as they believed him to be kind of a relic of the past. This led to an occurrence which I never in my lifetime believed would ever happen. This is a little personal story. As I remember it, it was one of only two times that I ever heard my father cry. It was November 9, 1989, the day the Berlin Wall fell. I never forget when I went with my dad to Germany, having seen the wall back in 1970 and being awed by its size and the guards and the tanks on the eastern side of the wall. When we headed to East Berlin, I was really overcome by the grayness and then the sadness of the people. This event caught the Soviet leadership completely off guard. Gorbachev now realized that his goal of a gradual transition was over. Laws were being passed in surrounding countries like Estonia that de they declared that they had the right to veto any laws coming out of Moscow. Latvians and Lithuanians began to openly protest against Russia. By June of, 18, of 1989, both Estonia and Lithuania declared that they were now economically independent of the Soviet Union and could overrule any law passed in Moscow. Boris Yeltsin began to make more and more noise. When he ran for election as a non- or an anti-nomenclatura candidate, he received about 90% of the vote. The conservative communists despised the man, and it was only when one member stood down and gave him his seat did Yeltsin join the Congress. Gorbachev did nothing to oppose the decision, despite Yeltsin's growing criticism of the Soviet leader. He couldn't if he wanted to, as he needed to show his commitment to democratization. Yeltsin began to rally the radicals, especially those of Russian backgrounds. Three hundred of them, led by Yeltsin, Sakharov, Afanasyev, and Gavril Popov, gathered to push Gorbachev to speed up reform. What is odd here is that there was a strong anti-Russian feeling amongst many of the nations within the USSR, and here was Yeltsin creating a pro-Russian organization. The split was deepening. It is at this point that Ligachev challenged Gorbachev, excuse me, had he challenged Gorbachev's leadership in the Communist Party, he may have succeeded and could have put a stop to the many reforms. But strangely enough, like many of the other post-Stalin leaders, he lacked the intestinal fortitude to do it. This lack of guts was to show itself yet again when 1991 rolled around. There was another movement that began to grow rapidly, and that was the resurgence of the Russian Orthodox Church. Long subjugated to abuse and censorship, Gorbachev allowed the Church to return to Russian society. The Bible was beginning to be sold openly. Churches were returned to the Orthodox hierarchy, and the millennium celebration of the institution of Orthodoxy in Russia in 1988, 1,000 years after Vladimir the Great brought Christianity and Orthodoxy in particular to Russia, this was celebrated with a meeting between Gorbachev and Patriarch Pimen. Churches were packed to capacity as the people felt free to celebrate their beliefs for the first time in 80 years. More and more, Russia was opening up as books for the West were now free to be sold, and even Paul McCartney of the Beatles recorded an album for the Russian market. Times there were a changing, and Gorbachev must be given accolades for this.
So how did the people feel about all of the political machinations going on? Let me quote Robert Service from his book, A History of Modern Russia. Quote, Youth did not revolt against authority. It despised it and ignored it. Indeed, citizens, both young and old, treated politics as a spectator sport, but not a process deserving their participation. The quest for private pleasure outdid the zeal for public service. Whereas Gorbachev believed that with an opening of society and the allowance of discussion of the issues of the day, well, everybody would see the benefits of the new version of Marxism-Leninism. The only problem is, no one wanted to hear it anymore. While the Eastern Bloc countries were losing their communist leaders and the Baltics were in an uproar, what scared Gorbachev were the rumblings in the Ukraine. Their national identity was long suppressed, but that suppression was no longer something that the Soviet leader was willing to do. By making the decision to not control secessionist talk within the Ukraine, he sealed the deal on the dissolution of the USSR. By the second half of 1989, the dominoes were falling so rapidly the world was holding its breath, waiting for the next shoe to drop. First, Poland shed its communist cloak in an election. Then Václav Havel became the leader in Czechoslovakia. Nikolai Ceausescu tried to escape Romania in December of 1989, but he was captured and quickly executed. By the end of the year, only Albania remained in communist hands. At the dawn of 1990, the Politburo finally saw that Gorbachev was steering the Soviet ship into a giant iceberg, and there was frankly nothing any of them could do. The problem was that Gorbachev was no longer the leader of the reform movement. He was now just another centrist, and the reformers were now steering the ship. At the helm was one Boris Yeltsin. Not willing to give up, in February of 1990, a new platform was announced whose stated goal was, quote, the main objective of the transitional period is the spiritual and political liberation of society. Communism was officially dead. As Robert Service puts it, quote, since Lenin, socialism had been depicted as merely a first post-capitalist stage towards the ultimate objective, communism. Now, socialism itself had become the ultimate objective, and Gorbachev's socialism would be a socialism antagonistic to dictatorship, to casual illegality, to a hypertrophied state economy, and to cultural and religious intolerance. Gorbachev also demanded that Article 6 of the 1977 USSR Constitution be revoked. It was the law that stated that only the Communist Party was allowed to operate. He got what he wanted. Then Boris Yeltsin saw this big opening. He announced in March 1990 that he would run for the leadership position of the RSFSR. While he couldn't challenge Gorbachev as the head of the USSR, he could challenge him in Russia proper. Many of the conservatives and even some of the more liberal reformers asked Gorbachev to squash Yeltsin, but to no avail. Gorbachev was steadfast in his policy of perestroika. Yeltsin then informed the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia that his country would not force them to remain in the USSR. In June of 1990, Uzbekistan declared its sovereignty. Then the unthinkable happened. Yeltsin declared the sovereignty of the RSFSR. This was followed quickly by Tartarstan and Karelia. In September, it was Turkmenistan's turn. The 28th Party Congress met on June 2, 1990, and there Gorbachev's critics went off on him, shouting insults and complaining about the state of affairs. Alas, there were too few of them. Alexander Yakolev, a longtime supporter of Gorbachev, was ousted from the Central Committee, and Ligachev was beaten as well. Gorbachev himself survived. 
Yeltsin's group demanded that Gorbachev step down as party head, but he refused. Then, Yeltsin's group simply walked out. Gorbachev's fiercest proponents of reform left him. The Soviet leader knew that if he left at that moment, the right-wing conservatives would grasp at the reins of power and that the whole reform movement and the change within society could turn absolutely ugly and violent. The economic situation was going from bad to worse. Industrial output was falling, agricultural systems were collapsing, and the USSR had to increasingly go to the Western world to help out. The people of the Soviet Union at the end of 1990 wondered whether they were headed to another period of starvation. But now, the rats were beginning to bail on the sinking ship known as the SS Gorbachev. First Yakolev, then Vadim Bakatin, and Vadim Medvedev jumped. One of Gorbachev's chief economic advisors, Nikolai Petrikov, also left. Ryazkov had to leave due to a heart condition and was replaced by the more conservative Valentin Pavlov. Then Shevardnadze walked away. Gorbachev now went back to the man who supported him in the past, Boris Yeltsin. Mikhail Sergeyevich miscalculated Yeltsin's popularity. A protest in his support garnered over 200,000 Muscovites, with over 50,000 Ministry of Internal Affairs troops watching. They worked together with nine Republican leaders to draft a new Union treaty with the hopes of saving the USSR. At an ensuing meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, Gorbachev was roundly criticized, so he handed in his resignation, which could have been accepted and the conservatives could have taken over. But again, they lacked the guts and asked him to rescind his resignation. Gorbachev had won. By 1991, when this new deal was struck, the Soviet economy was in a complete freefall. Industrial output was plunging, fuel was in short supply, and food prices were soaring. By July 1991, he went to a meeting of the group of seven Western leaders asking for help. The Soviet people viewed this, quote, as that of a cap-in-hand beggar. Yeltsin demanded that, Russia should get up off her knees. By now, Yeltsin had won an incredible majority in the election of the president of the RSFSR. He banned the Communist Party from using government offices. Yeltsin was gaining more and more support from the people. This man of simple origins was a power to be reckoned with. By July of 1991, Shevardnadze and Yakolev warned Gorbachev that there was a coup d'etat coming. The Soviet leader just dismissed the warning, and in early August, he headed to the Black Sea village of Foros to vacation. On July 23, 1991, a letter was published from 12 public figures called Word to the People. It complained bitterly about the current conditions in the USSR. Quote, an enormous, unprecedented misfortune had occurred. The motherland, our country, the great state entrusted to us by history, by our glorious forebears, is perishing, is being broken up, is being plunged into darkness and oblivion. Gorbachev was completely oblivious to this obvious call for a coup d'etat. As service comments, quote, the only precaution he took in summer 1991 was to ask Yeltsin informally to stay in Moscow while the Gorbachev family took a holiday in the Crimea. On August 18th, Gorbachev was visited in his dacha by Shenin, Maklanov, Varinikov, and his personal assistant, Valery Bolden. They calmly asked that Gorbachev hand over power to Vice President Yaneyev. Mikhail Sergeyevich had noticed that the phones were inoperative. But he stood his ground and refused to step down and even cursed at them, sending them out the door. Marinikov went to Kiev to declare that Gorbachev was ill and could no longer lead. 
Baklanov, Shannon, and Bolden headed to Moscow to meet with other crew members, KGB chief Karyuchkov and Interior Minister Pugo were trying to recruit more conspirators. Many joined, even Gorbachev's longtime friend and Supreme Soviet leader, Anatoly Lukyanov. But from this point on, the coup began to look more like a Marx Brothers comedy than a well-thought-out plan. Pavlov became drunk and unable to attend the televised conference to the people announcing the overthrow. Yaneyev twitched on screen wildly, and the rest of the group looked hopelessly pathetic. Then something unexpected happened. The people took to the streets. While the tanks were being sent out, they were being driven by young men who were bewildered when confronted by all the people out there. Telephones were still working, as were fax machines. A dangerous situation for the coup, as the word was being spread faster than they can control the situation. And Yeltsin was free. Another blunder which allowed him to rally supporters. None more important than Pavel Grachev, the commander of Soviet airborne and ground forces. The same man the coup members counted on for support for their side. Unfortunately for them, uh, they didn't question Grachev about his loyalties. They were to pay dire consequences for this mistake. On August 19th, coup members decided to up the ante by storming what is known in Moscow as the White House. Yeltsin had already rallied his supporters to build barricades and form a human shield around the building. The world was aware, and we were holding our collective breaths. The Soviet Union looked like it was near another state of civil war. Yaneyev was already teetering now in his support of the coup. On the night of the 20th going into the 21st, tanks began to circle around the gold, the Garden Ring Road of Moscow. The people tried to block their paths all over, and leading to an unfortunate accidental death of three men, Dmitry Komar, Ilya Krichevsky, and Vladimir Usov. Yeltsin made his way to the White House, as did cellist Mstislav Rostopovich, along with Eduard Shavradnadze and Alexander Yakolev. But the big news were the people. The thousands and thousands of people ready to throw off the yoke of oppression and protect their rights. Little did they all know, the conspirators were quickly getting cold feet. Military commanders were beginning to back away from them, one by one. By 2.15 p.m., the main coup members were on board a plane, headed to the Crimea to beg forgiveness. Gorbachev refused to see any of them, except Anatoly Lukyanov. He berated his old friend, calling him a traitor, and then threw him out. Yeltsin's vice president, Rutskoy, took charge and escorted the coup members back to Moscow on his plane. On August 22nd, Gorbachev returned to Moscow at midnight. But the city he returned to was no longer his. Yeltsin had taken control, but the real change was that Gorbachev's image had been shattered with the coup. No one believed that he was in charge anymore. In a public appearance at a meeting of the Supreme Soviet of the RSFSR, Yeltsin ordered Gorbachev around like a father does to a young child. It must have been terribly humiliating. Still, the Soviet head tried to keep the Union together, but his undoing was the Ukraine's refusal to stay in the USSR. On December 8th, the Commonwealth of Independent States was agreed upon putting together Belarus, the Ukraine, and Russia. On December 21st, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan joined. Georgia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia declined. The USSR now had just one last goodbye to say, and the person to close the door on the country was Mahikat Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. On December 25th, he appeared on television and gave the following short speech, quote, 
I leave my post with trepidation, but also with hope, with faith in you and your wisdom and force of spirit. We are inheritors of a great civilization, and now the burden falls on each and every one that it may be resurrected to a new, modern, and worthy life. Six days later, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the Soviet Union, the USSR, was no more. From 1917 until 1991, a span of a mere 74 years, the great communist experiment was conducted, much of it on the backs of the people of the region. Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernenko, and finally Gorbachev were the names associated with the rulers of the USSR. This great superpower was now gone in the proverbial blink of an eye. We can look back at the past 40, yes, 40 podcasts, and see this vast history of a country that shook the world, and now we see it lying in ashes. Millions upon millions, tens of millions, died for this vision of Marx and Lenin. Murdered and tortured souls and bodies lied strewn over the countryside, from Moscow and Kiev to Vladivostok and Siberia. Looking back, I can see why my old Russian history professor, Dr. Paul Average, was so smug when he told us back in 1976 that the Soviet Union would collapse in our lifetime. As a child of the Cold War, I thought he was crazy, but instead, he was prophetic. Join me next time as we talk about a brash, contradictory, and passionate Russian ruler, Boris Yeltsin. As for next time, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I'm going to be away for a while as I'm off to Australia to do a series of lectures in Sydney and Melbourne, and won't be able to record a podcast until at least I get back, and then you've got... All those weeks of business that are going to be laying on my table waiting for me to take action. The good news is that the flights are quite long, and I'll have plenty of time to write a few podcast scripts. Now, don't forget to go over to the new blog site at www.russianrulershistory.com, where I'm in the midst of listing the top 10 Russian rulers as well as the 10 worst. And when you're done there, you can head over to our Facebook page, at Russian Rulers History, where you can join the almost 500 members who ask phenomenal questions, make great comments, share videos and pictures, and also leave some great suggestions for future podcasts. And now, as always, Das Vidanya Ispasiba Bolshoya.